The Samnite Linen Legion, or Legio Lintiata, was an elite unit fielded by the Samnites. Although some scholars are a bit confused as to whether or not this legion existed, the Samnites were some of the fiercest warriors in all of the Italian peninsula. Although not fully united, the four tribes would often come together to attack or defend themselves against outside powers, noticeably the invading Gauls and later the Romans. As a result of basically being surrounded by hostile nations, the Samnites took war extremely seriously. Those that could afford the higher quality of armour would join the army, whilst those that couldn't stayed home on the farms. Now rather surprisingly, the Samnites had an elite unit of soldiers. According to Titus Livius, quote, The Samnites readied themselves for war with great commitments and abundance of shining armours, end quote. Those that were joining the elite unit, known as the Legio Lintiata, would swear sacred oaths. The Samnites would call upon their gods to convince the best of the best to join the Lintiata. Those that refuse the call to arms, according to Titus Livius again, would be subjected to Jupiter's curse. Once everybody signed up, they would be ordered to assemble at a specific place, ready to march to war. Now the place where these warriors assembled was usually decorated with fences draped with pieces of cloth. To prove their loyalty, the individual soldier would be asked if they would ever refuse an order to go and fight. If he refused, he was immediately killed and thrown onto a heap of similarly fated warriors to drive home the point. Once the army had been whittled down to the bravest and most loyal soldiers, the survivors were then given shiny new armour with plumed helmets to distinguish themselves from the normal Samnite warriors. This is where the name Legio Lintiata comes from, after the cloth that was draped over these fences, as well as the fantastic armour that was then given to these warriors. Arms and armour. We have a final in-depth account as to what armour the Lentiata wore. This is again thanks in large part to Titus Livius, who seems to have been writing extensively about this type of Samnite unit. Now there is some debate as to how accurate Livius' description is, and even then there are some debates as to what exactly Livius is describing. The classic example of this is in the actual armour the Lentiata wore. The common consensus is that the Lentiata wore a special type of armour known as the Lorica Lentiata. Some say that this was an early precursor to the famous Lorica Segmentata, the famous type of armour worn by the Roman legionaries. Some believe that this armour was made up of layers of fabric interwoven with an iron mesh, making it difficult to move in. Another more plausible description of what the Lorica Lentiata was, was that it is simply the Roman Latin name for the Linothrax. Now the Linothrax was a type of armour used in ancient Greece and the surrounding regions during the classical period. It is consisted of multiple layers of linen fabric which were glued together and then moulded into a breastplate that offered a good level of protection against arrows, slashing attacks and some forms of blunt force. The use of the Linothrax was a significant innovation at the time, as it was lighter, more flexible and cheaper to produce than traditional bronze armour. The Greeks are believed to have influenced the Samnites to adopt the Linothrax. The Samnites were known for their warrior culture and their prowess in battle, but they lacked the resources to produce the expensive bronze armour that was common among other Mediterranean powers. Thus, when they encountered the Greeks, they were impressed by the effectiveness of the Linothrax and quickly adopted it as their own. Over time, the Samnites refined the design of the Linothrax to better suit their needs. They added metal scales or plates to the armour to provide additional protection, and they used leather or wool to line the interior of the armour, which helped to absorb shock and reduce chafing. 
The Samnites continued to use the Linothrax throughout the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE, and it became a defining feature of their military culture. For helmets, we have to take a more educated guess. We know that the helmet of choice for most Samnites was the Greek Attic Helmet. The Attic Helmet was a type of ancient Greek helmet that was popular during the Classical period. It was named after Attica, the region in Greece where it was first used. The helmet featured a wide brim that provided excellent protection for the wearer's neck and cheeks, as well as a sloping top that protected the head from direct blows. The helmet's design also allowed for good ventilation, which prevented the wearer from overheating in battle. The Samnites were known for their warrior culture and their preference for light and flexible armour. They adopted the Attic Helmet because it offered good protection while also being relatively lightweight and easy to move in. The helmet was also relatively simple to produce, which made it a practical choice for people who lacked the resources to produce more ornate or complex armour. The Samnites made some modifications to the Attic Helmet to better suit their needs. They added cheek guards to provide additional protection, and they extended the neck guard to provide more coverage for the back of the head. They also sometimes decorated the helmets with feathers or other ornaments to distinguish themselves in battle. The Samnites continued to use the Attic Helmet throughout the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE, and it became a defining feature for their military culture. We do know that the Lintiata often decorated their helms with elaborate plumes. These plumes distinguished themselves from the other Samnite warriors, who more often than not decorated their helmets with just feathers. Another Greek element that the Samnites wore were greaves. Greek greaves were a type of leg armour worn by the ancient Greek warriors during the Classical period. They were made of bronze or other metals and were designed to protect the shins from injury in battle. The greaves were typically fitted to the lower leg and were held in place with straps or other fastenings. The Samnites adopted Greek greaves because they offered good protection for the shins while also being relatively lightweight and easy to move in. The Samnites also made modifications to the greaves to better suit their needs. They often used only one greave on their attacking leg, as this leg was more likely to be exposed to attacks from the opponent. By only wearing one greave, the Samnites were able to minimise the weight and restriction of movement while still receiving some protection. Overall, the Samnites' adoption of the Greek greaves and their modifications to their use helped to make them a formidable fighting force in ancient Italy. In terms of shields, there seems to be a description of the type of shield that the Lintiata used, which is both at the same time descriptive but also incredibly vague about which shields this group of warriors used. Quote, the upper part larger than the rest to protect the chest and shoulders and horizontal at the very top. The lower section is more pointed to facilitate freedom of motion. End quote. Now, first of all, this is terrible grammar so it is a very direct translation. However, I think we can roughly piece the fragments together and come to the conclusion that the Legio Lentiata used the Oblong Scutum. The Samnite Oblong Scutum was a type of shield used by the Samnites during the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE. The shield was rectangular with a curved top and bottom that allowed the user to deflect incoming blows. The shield was typically made of wood and covered in leather, which provided good protection against arrows and other ranged weapons. The Samnite Oblong Scutum was distinctive in its size and shape. It was larger than many other shields used in ancient warfare, measuring roughly 1.2 meters in length and 60 centimeters in width. The oblong shape of the shield was also unique as it allowed the user to cover more of their body than a round or oval shaped shield would. The curved top and bottom of the shield also provided additional coverage to the user's head and legs. The Samnites often decorated their shields with elaborate designs, such as images of animals, gods or other symbols of their culture. 
These decorations served both practical and symbolic purposes. On a practical level, they helped to identify the shield's owner during battle. Symbolically, they helped to reinforce the warrior ethos of the Samnites and inspire fear in their opponents. Now, this is where what we know about the equipment of the Legio Lintiata comes to an abrupt end. And we have to make an educated guess about the weapons the Legion used. We can conclude that the Lintiata fought with javelins. The Samnites preferred javelins for several reasons. First, javelins were relatively easy to produce and could be made from readily available materials such as wood and iron. This made them a practical choice for people who lacked the resources to produce more complex weapons. Second, javelins were versatile and could be used for a variety of purposes. They could be thrown at enemies from a distance, used to defend against oncoming attackers, or even used as makeshift melee weapons in close combat. This flexibility made javelins a valuable tool in the Samnite's arsenal. In addition to their practical advantages, javelins also had symbolic significance for the Samnites. The use of javelins in battle was closely associated with the Samnites' warrior ethos, which emphasised courage, strength and skill in combat. By using javelins, the Samnites were able to demonstrate their martial prowess and distinguish themselves from other Italian people. This is also why we can't discuss what the Legio Lintiata did in battle. There is no job role, no descriptions of them in battle, nothing. The only thing we can assume is that when cornered, they fought to the death. For if they ran away, their side would have killed them for breaking their oath. We know that failing to even report a desertion was punishable by death within this unit. Simply put, we just don't know. But it is a cool unit, nonetheless. Thank you for watching and listening to our videos. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe if you've enjoyed. Or if you really like the channel, consider supporting us on Patreon. There, for as little as $1 a month, you'll gain access to an ever-expanding variety of exclusive Ancient History Guy content not found anywhere else online. All donations go directly back into the channel, helping us on our campaign to conquer YouTube. All sources are listed and linked in the description below. I've been the Ancient History Guy, and as always, I'll be seeing you later.